Hello, welcome to A Reel of One's Own. My name is Andrea Thompson, and I'm the producer of this show. The things you will hear over the next hour or so represent the views of me, A Reel of One's Own, and the people making them. All opinions and quotations in no way represent Riverwest Radio and are the sole responsibility of the producer, guests, and callers. Riverwest Radio is not liable for any legal issues arising from the content of this program. Okay. Formal introduction over. This is A Reel of One's Own with Andrea Thompson. And um, I've got, if I get to all of them, I've got a couple of very different movies to discuss today. I saw a bunch of the, a bunch of the bigger and smaller movies that opened up today. So let me start out with the worst. And that is Breaking Dawn Part 2. Um, the final film in what they're calling the Twilight Saga. Please, it's not a saga. Anyway, not much can be said about this that hasn't kind of been said already, but... And plus, since I'm no longer a sexually repressed high school girl who has grown out of trying to have her cake and eat it too, Twilight really doesn't hold much appeal for me. And Breaking Dawn Part 2 kind of holds even less appeal for me since... With... With the other movies, at least, you know, the other movies before Breaking Dawn, the three the three before them, they had action. They discussed love in a way and all that other crap. And Bella had to choose between her two suitors. But um, this movie just seems so inconsequential that it really will have no appeal besides core audience. And it makes it even worse was that they split it into two. So it's it's even more inconsequential because of that. So much more irrelevant. And... Anyway, on to the plot. The movie picks up kind of right where the previous movie left off in that, you know, Breaking Dawn Part 1 ended when Bella opened her eyes right after becoming a vampire. And this one, well, she wakes up and and pretty much she's a vampire and, and a much more interesting character. But really, she had nowhere to go but up. And so she finds that it's... As a newborn, she's actually stronger than Edward now, and she's really liking being a vampire. And we get the inevitable scene where she gets to finally show off some skills. You know, she goes to hunt, and she kind of gets gets a hint of darkness in there when she kind of senses a human and almost kills him. But, of course, she manages to run away. And all the others in the Cullen family, you know, Edward's... Um, Bella's love interest, Edward, in case she had been living under a rock. All the ones in, um, in Edward Cullen's family mentioned that they've never seen a newborn act as well, of, as, well as Bella has and control herself as well. Sigh, more on that later. And of course she meets her daughter, Renesme, worst name ever. And of course Bella is in no way of wanting to uh, in danger of wanting to harm her daughter, even though her daughter is half human and has a heartbeat. And it's, of course, it's brought up once, but of course Bella has more control of herself than apparently any new word vampire in the history of the world. <sighs> and also, this is kind of where the dip- disappointments and distractions, too, begin, because that baby is really creepy. It's, it's, you know, it's all CGI, and so it's really distracting, it looks really fake, and it really takes you out of the experience, at least for me. And it's really not until the kid grows up and stabilizes a bit and they use an actual actress, child actress, without any CGI, that she actually looks real. So that's a problem. And anyway, so the story, I guess, it really picks up after Irina, a member of another vampire clan, the Denali, sees Renesme and believes that the Cullens have turned a child into a vampire, which is pretty much the ultimate taboo because apparently this caused a lot of problems and a lot of deaths hundreds of years back since a vampire child is apparently beautiful, adorable, and so lovable and pretty uncontrollable in its need for blood so so um, a lot of so they were all so apparently they were all killed and the children too and anybody who protected protected them so so since a whole lot of vampires would die to protect these vampire children that caused a lot of pain and suffering and um so after so so the so the vampire who saw Renesme Irina goes goes to Volturi and reports that they've done that they've done this and of course you know um the 
One of the Cullen family, Alice, who has premonitions, can see the future, of course sees that the, these vampire enforcers, the Volturi, who, who enforce all the laws, are coming for them. So the Cullens decide to gather up enough witnesses to hopefully get the Volturi to listen and realize that Renezme is not an immortal child and is, of course, completely capable of controlling herself and poses no threat. Really, she's not dangerous at all, doesn't go into the dark territory that it would logically go into, and... Uh, anyway, so they go out and they collect this cast of characters, vampires from across the globe, some of whom has various powers, such as creating illusions and controlling the elements. And during all of this, um, the one who has premonitions, um, Alice and her guy Jasper, they leave for some unforeseen reason unforeseen reason that comes into play later. Oh, and of course the wolves, they also gather to help. So we got these <laughs> cast of characters from around the globe with all these cool powers and the wolves. And of course they're just witness, not fight, but if necessary, blah blah blah. And oh yeah, since we saw in the last film that Jacob had imprinted on Renesme, so one of the only funny scenes in the movie is Bella actually being really angry and protective of Renesmee about this and shoving Jacob around a bit and Edward really being pleased watching all of this and honestly I can't blame him too much for that. I mean, if your girlfriend almost the whole time you were in your this girl who you were in your relationship with, if almost the whole time she's constantly saying that the guy who's trying to steal her away and constantly proclaim, proclaims his love for her is her best friend and insisting on keeping that guy in her life, uh, I might I might enjoy her shoving shoving Jacob around too. And to her credit, Christian Stewart at least seems to be really enjoying finally playing a Bella actually doing things like training and fighting and actually keeping up with Edward. Because really, the only time in this movie when she smiles is when she's showing off her strength. And that includes the really awkward sex scenes and all that. And the touching scenes where she's probably supposed to smile. And anyway, so cast of characters, well set for the Volturi to come, and well, a huge letdown happens, because I suppose the big finale in the book was just a huge cop-out with a lot of talking, kind of like the end of Blood anime. So, with the Blood series, I mean. Um, so, with the movie, they they had to have a fight scene in there somehow, I mean, come on, you, you, you can get away with that in the books, just assemble all this and go through all this effort and not have a fight scene, but in a movie, and the way they, but in the, you can't get away with that in a movie, and the way they do it, it's just awful. You know, I suppose they did the best they could because they still had to be faithful to the books, but it's, it's still not enough, and I can't tell you anymore because it would risk ruining for you. For you and <sighs> just just tell just trust me it's a huge letdown and I dislike this film and Breaking Dawn part one so much mainly because of the serious themes like in the previous movies you could just laugh and enjoy all the crap that they were putting out there but that really changed with Breaking Dawn because in the previous movies, they didn't really try any serious issues. It was just about her. There was really no stakes. But in Breaking Dawn, they upped the stakes and they tried to introduce serious issues like, why is a why was abortion in in Twilight? That just makes no sense. And that will probably keep me ranting for the whole hour. Or so, let me just say this one thing that no matter what side you're on in the abortion debate, that topic does not have any place in a franchise like this because if you want to discuss that right it should it had better be explored because obviously this is a divisive very emotional topic and it should only be explored in an intelligent way by talented people on screen you know and obviously those people do not work on this franchise so topics like that have no place in Breaking Dawn because of course they're not going to discuss it in any intelligent way at all and they didn't and Anyway, and also another problem I have with Breaking Dawn is they did up the stakes, but with no kind of conflict. And, I mean, they got us power together and it's not used? Why? And, but honestly, the top thing that really, anger, that really angers me here, the, the top thing out of all the things to be angry about in, in, this, in the Twilight franchise, the top thing is basically the lack of consequences and how it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, 
I haven't read that many teen franchise, teen series things, and haven't seen all the friend the the movie franchises, teen franchises. But from what I've seen, from Harry Potter to the Hunger Games, even though they're for kids, they're pretty good at showing consequences. You know, the main character is faced with evil, generally, or just really bad circumstances, and they do what they think is right, and it shows what happens when you go up against something like that. Bad things do happen, like people do die as a result of these actions that they felt like they had no choice but to take. There are consequences. But in this case, um, Bella really easily seems to have her cake and eat it too, you know? She doesn't have to choose between Jacob and Edward. She doesn't have to tell her father she's dead and deal with the pain her actions would cause. She doesn't have to give up having a family. And she doesn't really have to feel, have to face any real moral dilemmas or the ugliness really that comes with being a vampire. I mean, when one vampire shows off how he can manipulate elements in the water when splashes down, the other vampires don't even get wet. That's how few consequences, that's how few the stakes, how, that's, that's just shows like no consequences, no stakes really. Um, but the movie does try to up the stakes with no consequences and that makes the movie even more of an insult because they still felt the need to split it into two and it doesn't really work on its own. So, and, but there is a but coming as you can probably sense, please bear with me and and keep listening when I say this because I can explain I would probably they're already talking about relaunching the these series if they did relaunch it you know with all these with the Hulk and Spider-Man and all that being relaunched having relaunches within like five five years after the original movie um, they're already talking about who would play who would play all the roles if there was a relaunch and please please let me explain I would kind of I should probably take a drink of water because I have a lot of explaining to do. One sec. Okay, I would welcome a relaunch. Now let me explain. As I would welcome a relaunch, but as long as the relaunch focused on the real heroine in this story. Because Bella is not the heroine of this story, the hero, because she doesn't really do anything, she, but she is an important part of the story. She's the catalyst. Others kind of take care of the consequences of her actions. I mean, in fairy tales, the princess in the tower is an important part of the story, but she's not the hero. I mean, if the fairy tale were from her point of view, it would probably be pretty boring to just sit around in a tower or, ca or castle or whatever. So, so Bella's the princess in the tower, not the hero. And so you prob so when I say that you probably want to know who is the real hero of Twilight. And I would say it's actually Alice, Bella's BFF and the vampire with the premonitions. Just think about this. Who is able to save and warn her family repeatedly from the first book? You, you know, right when she saw the nomads coming, Alice. I mean, she not only sees the future, she takes action. She does something about it. And and again, who brought Bella to Italy so she could save Edward just by showing up? Alice. And who is the real prize? The one that the Volturi are really after, which they say in both the book and the movie. Alice. The Volturi want her and her power. And who goes on her own to find out information about Renesmee to make sure that Renesmee will be okay while also providing an avenue for Renesmee to escape in case it doesn't work out? Alice. She does everything. And uniquely, she wasn't, she wasn't made by the Cullens, the Carlisle, the family patriarch. She wasn't made by him. So she was able to survive on her own for years um, before he even came around. And so Alice is independent. She does things. She's quirky. She's fun, kind, welcoming, so very likable, but affected enough by her vampire nature to keep it interesting. And she's got a very interesting and amazing backstory, which they didn't go into in the in the movies, so which is which was a real shame. So, and although these things shouldn't matter in the franchise for, for teenage girls, they do. She's also beautiful, she's a good party planner, and she's very fashionable. So put all these things together and really you got the perfect 
heroin that not only teenage girls were like, but will probably draw on more people. So I, and I just bet, how much more interesting would it be to have it narrated from her point of view while she's in Italy, while she's off seeking information in Brazil and seeing life in the future from her point of view and all that. So relaunch the Twi Twilight series, but make her the hero. She it because she is the real hero. And anyway, um, so what's my final verdict? Um, now that I've ranted, I still have to give this, well, a higher grade than a D because when I was in the theater, everyone there, all the teenagers, you know, really seemed to love it and they had a really strong reaction. I mean, I heard one person say coming out that they could see it 30 times. 30 times. So while it doesn't leave anything for the rest of us, it does seem to perfectly satisfy its core audience. So, again, not the lowest grade, but still, I wish they'd have left a little tiny bit for the rest for the rest of us the way the previous films did. So, final verdict? I'd say about a C minus. Ugh. Okay, and now that I've gone over one of the worst examples of a film I've ever seen, I want to go, go into one of the best movies I've ever seen. One that opened this weekend, Lincoln. Wow. This, oh, this so wonderfully canceled out the stupidity of Twilight because I saw it the day after, so thank, thank God for that. Um, um, and... Now, the title might be misleading because while Lincoln is obviously the focus, it's the last months of his life that the movie shows us. Um, namely, the struggle to pass the 13th Amendment, outlawing slavery into law. Now, I had no idea if this is true or not, but the movie proposes something that seems almost unthinkable now. That there was actually a lot of danger that even a northern that even though a northern victory became inevitable, there was a strong possibility that the South would still be able to have slaves even after they were readmitted to the Union. And this movie really hammers home that in spite of what other people have been trying to say about the Civil War, that the main issue was in fact slavery. Thank you. Because the first thing you see in this movie is Confederate and Union soldiers literally fighting and wrestling and killing each other in the mud. With the Union soldiers just happening fighting these confederate soldiers just happening to be black which really adds an extra punch and now obviously i do not approve of slavery by any means but you can but the movie is really good at depicting without making these people totally evil though i would argue that perhaps people who would believe this anyway you could you really get a good look at the people in the u.s who would allow that to happen you know that why they would allow, you know, slaves to remain to the institution of slavery to continue even after this civil war was supposedly being fought to stop this um, because, and I suppose it, the movie was really good at depicting those people as very much a product of their times when they say that pretty much every civilization at this, at this point had had slavery and there was no and how there was no higher authority to appeal to end this institution and how much of a fight it was to do so because slavery was profitable and had become a very deeply ingrained part of the south and a lot of people seemed willing to live with it if if it meant ending the war early and saving lives and plus the racism at the time meant that not many people in the US even in the union were even close to ready to look at freed slaves as equals. So at that point in time, the only the only objection you could make to slavery to it was on moral grounds, and I can think of no other issue as that as black more black and white than slavery. Pun not exactly intended, but made nevertheless. Um, so so yeah, in this movie you had no legal right. There was. Like I said, they were really good at showing how incomprehensible it was that there was no way to stop this other than moral grounds and pushing through legal protection. And, um, and so it was really moving to see Lincoln push for this and take a stand for this when so many more people, even who 
even people who objected to slavery did not want to give full equality to everyone. So in an issue like this, it would be really easy to get very overdramatic, especially when you have such a larger-than-life man like Lincoln and a great cast of characters around him. And let me just say, all the casting and acting is just spot on and incredible and which of course brings us to Lincoln himself because they really do an amazing job on Lincoln making him this kind of mesmerizing figure he probably was while still making him human and showing him interacting with his family and when he does interact with his family you know we've all seen before how power and devotion to a higher cause affects you and your family but a great movie can still show this and still have it affect you and this movie does it perfectly without overdoing it like just for one example when lincoln and his wife are discussing like i believe it was they said they they were dis they had to attend a party when they know when his when their son was sick you know a you know, this, well, not really a party, but more of a function. They did not know he was deathly ill, and they had, and they, it was important for them to attend this function to keep up the morale because it was a few years previous, it looked like they might lose a civil war, and their son died around, around this time while he was away, and they had that conversation. So, again, we've seen this before, but the right acting and writing, they, they could still make it moving, but they don't make anyone, especially Lincoln, too noble too noble because they also show how he excels as a politician which is obviously is not always going to be a good thing since his excellent since Lincoln's excellent political skills and the way he was willing to get down in the mud and play dirty to pass this important amendment and by doing things such as lying buying votes or offering jobs that kind of thing in exchange for votes to end to to push for ending slavery and more than that to push for legal protection so so this so it wouldn't happen again after the war which again the movie says was a real danger and the lincoln that's on that's on you know it's he's in his second term it's near the end of the civil war and so he's very old it shows him as kind of old and bred bent but by no means broken and very aware of the weight he has on his shoulders and he admits he knows very little about the people he's trying to free and of course they also show us little idiosyncrasies where he constantly tells people little stories that still pack a punch and and such of which of course all the people around him have to listen to and of course even then he's impossible to take your eyes off and of course the main reason this Lincoln is does pull you in so much is of course the actor playing him Daniel Day Lewis who is an actor that just loses himself in every role and this is no exception he's he's incredible he pulls you in he's talented again he loses himself and plus he has such an amazing cast around him that includes Sally Field Joseph, Joseph Gordon-Levitt Tommy Lee Jones Jackie Earl Haley and John Hawks of um, Winter's Bone and and what else Martha Martha Marcy May Marlene incredible and oh and one little note we complain about the partisanship and corruption today but the way these politicians go to each other verbally and in in Congress and sometimes even with guns let's just say thank God it took a long time to shoot and reload in those days so it really gives you a sense of perspective and I wish, I just wish they had focused on other aspects of his life because obviously he was quite a fascinating and complicated man. They showed how his opinions on slavery kind of changed and evolved. And just like today, he had to say rep reprehensible things even if he didn't believe them in order to get votes and keep the union together. Um, so, but I can't really take away take away points for that because they blatantly chose to focus on this aspect of Lincoln's life and and on this issue and how close the country kept getting to to again I repeat myself to keeping slave to, to keeping slaves still after the Civil War um, and because they chose to focus on this one aspect of his life they focus on it perfectly by choosing one thing and just the amount of detail and the talent and the time and attention and that they that they bring to this this movie is smart and entertaining and not boring and so go see it 
go see it. It's 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 wonderful. I would give it solid A plus final verdict. Okay, and last but by no means least is as different from the other two movies as they are from each other. It's a movie called The Sessions. Um, it's about a potent journalist named Mike O'Brien who had been rendered almost paralyzed from the neck down due to due to being sick with polio as a kid. So he spends this guy, Mark O'Brien, spends a lot of his time in an iron lung, but he still did manage to get a lot of done. He graduated from university. He was able, obviously, to write a lot of poetry and articles. And in 1988, at age 38, he decided to take up a new challenge, that of losing his virginity. So he decides to hire a sex surrogate named Cheryl, played by Helen Hunt, who specializes in assisting people who have trouble doing the deed. And, of course, a lot of this movie hinges on the performances of these two people, and both of them are really excellent. Again, I'm, John Hawks was in the previous movie I discussed, Abraham Lincoln, and he was also in Winter's Bone and Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene, and I mentioned, and he plays Mark O'Brien, and he does such a great job of it as a man who is kind of trying to become more of a human being and that he wants to find out what this great force sexes that plays such a huge role in our lives he wants to find out what that's all about and you really are able to believe him and empathize with him and the fact that john hawks can convince me of this is really amazing because i really only became aware of him although he's been actors uh active for years after winter's bone and once again the uh, movie I mentioned before, Martha Marcy May Marlene, where he, in both those movies, he kind of played the creepy, scary guy. And in the sessions, there's just no trace of that here. So, and Helen Hunt, she's also very wonderful as, because her character Cheryl is actually married with a husband and son. And of course, she actually starts really getting attached to Mark and is kind of force which forces her to rethink her life a little bit her marriage and all that so we also kind of have a character who's kind of as a necessity in the form of a catholic priest named father brendan who's played by william h macy always fun to see him work and he's the one who counsels mark and gives him his blessing so to speak in this enterprise and also kind of acts as a sounding board for mark so the audience can kind of better grasp what he's thinking. Yeah, so yeah, generally, priests are depicted either one of two ways, good and evil, you know, the kindly, liberal, laughing priest, or the really sinister, really, really, like, high-strung, very repressed guy. And I'm, and I'm glad the, that they focus on the, ni the nicer stereotype of priest for this movie, because it really fits. And, but in general, the sessions takes, kind of takes a very explicit, but still very kind of feel-good attitude about sex in general, and it kind of makes sense, because this does take place in California, in Berkeley, and I think it couldn't really be any, any other way. This is a really, really, um, very California movie, let's just say. So, um, and to the movie's credit, there, there is a good ending, but not the miracle ending, so to speak, and I can't really say any more without giving away, but it's a real feel-good movie, the talent is solid, the acting is good, you know, they do, they do really make, um, they do really, um, make it complicated, but not overly so, which is kind of to the movie's detriment, but still really good with the topic they they represent they represented and all that so really excellent i would give it a solid b plus and say it's really worth really worth watching pardon me All right, so after all this, um, 
I kind of, I kind of wanted to focus, you know, more on more of an action movie that's not really spo supposed to want me to think. So for my last movie review, I chose just pure, pure action movie. Um, Oliver Stone's new film, Savages, and in this, in this movie it really forces me to reference Twilight again because it's ironic that a movie and franchise that's largely about saving it till marriage kind of helped popularize a love triangle with a woman at the center and if you combine this trend with an adult audience that has long since served their time in high school well the erotic possibilities get certainly get more interesting and you know Savages involves just that. Um, basically, Taylor Kish and Aaron Johnson play these two pot dealers, Chan and Ben, while Blake Lively is Ophelia, or O oh, as she's called, the woman they kind of both love and share. And is the film, you know, they share sometimes separately, sometimes not. And O oh, is also the film's narrator. These two guys, Ben is basically the heart and brain of the relationship and the business. He's a do-gooder who uses the funds to, to support various charitable costs as well. Chan is the muscle. The he's the force who steps in if things become violent and who just so happens to be a former U.S. Navy SEAL. So basically the business is a pretty clean and mostly peaceful one with very few complaints until the quality of their crop networks draws the attention of the Mexican Baja Cartel, led by the ferocious Elena, played by Selma Hayek. So Ben and Sean then sense it's time for them to leave the business and make arrangements for the three of them to leave this, their little sunny California paradise. And shockingly, the cartel doesn't seem to take rejection all that well and decides to kidnap O in order to, to inspire more obedience from the boys. So mayhem and violence soon ensue, with the pacifist Ben in particular finding himself becoming a more and more brutal incarnation um, of himself, basically, in order to save the people he cares about. <laughs> but, as is usually the case with movies like this that kind of focuses on lovers, the lovers themselves are kind of bland, because the real soul of the movie kind of lies with Benicio del Toro and John Travolta, and del Toro plays a brutal, brutal cartel enforcer, and John Travolta is the corrupt DEA agent. <laughs> And they really just embody their characters with this kind of fierce energy and just this ferocity that makes them both compulsively watchable and just kind of the dark heart of the film. I just wish everyone else was as fascinating and watchable as they are. And the violence is kind of quandly, yeah, is kind of realistic in that the two guys just don't openly declare war on Elena, on Elena and go on a mindless bloody rampage. It still feels like there's a lot lacking. Maybe, again, maybe it's the what I mentioned, the blandness of the lovers, or maybe it's just missed opportunities. Stone kind of teeters on the edge of set of satire a few times, such as when O asks for salad in captivity because she because she thinks the pizza isn't healthy enough, and other and other interests when she and Ben in particular show just how little they know about the about the drug world they've they've gotten themselves into. So the movie's a very good one, but if Stone had pushed that angle just a little bit more, it probably could have really been great. And as it is, it kind of stands as kind of a cynical, really enjoyable commenter in our drug policy without being too preachy or pushing the message too hard. And because after all, the aim here really isn't to send send a message; it's to provide the audience with this kind of flashy, gritty, enjoyable action movie, even if it's a bit of a mess. Stone really succeeds really beautifully, so final grade, B+. Plus. And I also just want to draw your attention to something. Pardon me. Um, just a couple of few film fest that's going on right now. Um, the Nordic Film Fest is still running through Sunday at the UWM Union Theater, which kind of offers kind of different kind of films, so if you want to check it out, go ahead. And um, also, I want to draw your attention, if any of my listeners know about the Charles Alice Art Museum, that's at 1801 North Prospect Avenue, and they tend to screen kind of lesser known films of the 30s, 40s, few from the 50s, but generally they focus on the 30s and 40s. And it's, again, it's the f movies you generally don't see, you generally don't talk about, not the Citizen Kane, but or you know it's not all it's not all the more well-known movies it's the movies 
some of them you can't it's they're even hard to find on dvd so if you still do that call me old, call me old-fashioned um and anyway uh, about a, about once a month um, on a certain Wednesday they they tend to show these and admission is only five dollars if you're if you've got your student ID it's three dollars for seniors veterans and students and the latest offering that they're gonna have this next Wednesday actually is called wake of the red red witch and it's about John Wayne who takes to the high seas and for an adventure and John and John Wayne being somewhere other than the old than the old west Generally, when he does that, it's, it can be interesting and fascinated, and and his his day, no one could resist John Wayne. I personally found him a little, any, sometimes good at times. What can I say? He was before my time. So, yeah, check it out. Charles Alice Art Museum. Check out their schedule. They show a lot of good, really good things. And it's getting to that time where I might have where I might have to start signing off so I will just have to finish up here and I will just hmm or realize that the clock is wrong I might have time for one more movie review since I finished since I finished uh so I will finish up, I think, with the Iron Lady. Um, in many and in many um, kind of biopics, the subjects are often reduced to parental issues. So this was, and Margaret Thatcher was, and while I disagree with a lot of her politics, I kind of thought she deserved better than what the Iron Lady gives her. Like, um, when, I when I mentioned that they were, that they were reduced to um, parental issues, like in W, George W. Bush was seen as mostly driven by his dysfunctional relationship with his father, while another, another um, biopic, um, Hoover, he's never, he's depicted as never ever able to really free himself from his mother's grip. And in Iron Lady, the same sort of treatment is kind of given to Margaret Thatcher, Great Britain's first female prime minister. The film sees her as mainly formed by a grocer, by her father, who was a small time, small time grocer and his ideals, though we rarely see him doing anything other than giving speeches as an alderman. So there's not there's really thin material to work with but of course Meryl Streep she doesn't she's like Daniel Day Lewis and she doesn't play play her politician she channels her and she can always be relied upon to kind of elevate such material into a into a height that would hardly be possible without her but the main problem of the film is kind of its emphasis on the present as kind of this very as we see an elderly Thatcher go about her business and hallucinate her deceased husband who's really who's played in a really fun way by Jim Broadbent. We don't really see much of her formative years as we kind of quickly speed through a childhood defined by World War II and the and the bombings. So instead the film just kind of shows a little bit of that and then it speeds her up to get to her getting elected to parliament and she barely has time to acquaint herself with it and before the film again speeds up to her time of deciding to run for prime minister and again whether you, whether you disagree with, agree with her politics or not and I certainly don't um, you know she did break a lot of boundaries and it gives kind of a sense of the obstacles she faced like like just little things, all the men staring at her shocked, like from the, from the from the horrible state of the women's bathroom to a few a few other things. And again, it doesn't it doesn't really go in go into what what she had to go through to get where she had, um, and what exactly has she done since resigning since prime minister? The f the film doesn't really answer that question either. So you can't help feeling that you miss some of the most important parts of her life and but and quite a few things um, cause like her family and relationship with her children are kind of barely referred to 
and nor her husband's motivations and her success almost seems to be taken for granted we never really see her really struggle and fight against the social institutional sexism that the again i mentioned it kind of refers to it shows a few seconds of it and it kind of somehow glosses over it still and the main problem seems to be that the filmmakers don't seem to know what to make of Thatcher or how exactly to tell the story of such a powerful woman who worked hard to rise to the top who is also a conservative. Because, again, it, it's a shame because whether or not you agree with her politics or not, both Thatcher and Streep deserve much, much better material to work with. And she... Neither of them get it, but Meryl Streep, obviously, she really, really makes makes the movie so so much better than than it would have been. And again, we've all I mentioned before, we've all seen how the how people in politics and the pursuit of power and devote and being devoted to something else affects your family. And this movie doesn't does not succeed the way Lincoln did in making it seem fresh and new. Again, it glosses over it and. It, Expects you expects you to get it if you'd spent a few more frames on it or packed more of an institutional punch. It 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 it's just not it's just not there. We don't feel we don't feel her pain. We don't we don't we don't, we don't really feel it. And again, by focusing on the last months of her life, I feel like does it a, a disservice if it was if it was listed as less about her life than of the effects of aging. In, in a society and all that, um, it would it would be a lot better. But but they try try to do it both ways, and again, does not succeed. So yeah, while it's still worth what might be worth watching simply because of Meryl Streep, don't expect any great things from it. Huh, so and that that is that is going to be it for today. So once again, I want to. Thank you all for listening, and sorry for the two, few technical glitches. And if, again, if you're a filmmaker of Milwaukee and you or you know of a particular film that you think hasn't been getting enough attention, particularly if it's a local film made with local people and all that, so those are a real labor of love. Again, I'll always go easier on a film like that than on a big studio film. So again, tell me if I'm not aware of it or. I would love, if you're a filmmaker or you're involved, I would love to have you on to, dis to discuss it. So let me know. Um, email me, a reel of one's own at gmail.com. That's all one word, all lowercase, a reel of one's own, and that is R E E L. Or find, find me on Twitter. Once again, same, same thing, reel of one's own. All right, so once again, thank you for listening, and that is me signing off.